Hey guys, and welcome to another walk-in Wednesday. Now that's a stretch because this one actually didn't walk in. I went and got it. So first I want to do a shout out to my good friend, Scott Benedict, uh, who uh, owns and operates pre98.com. Uh, first of all, Scott taught me a lot about collecting way back in the day when I first got started. He's been uh, actually doing this longer than me. It's hard to imagine. Uh, probably younger than me, but he's been doing this a lot longer. But he, he uh, taught me a lot about the collecting, especially the odd variations, which I don't know much about. And I was on his website, and I saw this pistol. And I, I was going to be going to a local gun show. Actually, it was on December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. I said, hey, uh, bring this gun, and I'd, I'd like to take a look at it. And the only reason I wanted to take a look at it was to do this video. So he actually has this on his website. I did not buy it, but I asked to borrow it in order to bring it to you because this, this gun has a very cool story with it. So let me start off by saying, uh, if you haven't watched my video about the Baby Nambu, uh, please make sure you watch that because I give a lot of the background and the manufacturer of the Baby Nambu back in the 1920s. Um, so this is a typical baby Nambu in much better shape than most. Uh, remember I mentioned uh, many of them have pitting for the obvious reason. They went, they went to sea, salt air got on them. This one is better than most. It just has a, a, a few little speckles on it, uh, which you can see here in, in the video. Uh, the ma the uh, mag is matching number to the gun, and the grips would also, you'll take my word for it, the grips are also matching number to the gun, and it shoots 7 millimeter. We talk about that in the previous video. It comes with this soft shell holster. Rare to find the original straps with it. The soft shell holster is uh, also very valuable. These can certainly be worth uh, up to $2,500. Uh, we had one of the rarer hard shell. Uh, this is a soft shell. And you can see the Tokyo Arsenal along with other writing uh, inside the flap. And then you also see the same symbol for the Tokyo Arsenal on the gun. Uh, there's about 6,000 of these made, and the, you can see that the serial number on this one, it was near the end of the run, about 1923. Uh, that's going to be important later when I tell the story. So this was made uh, in the mid-20s. With it came, it, they're so compact, I just love it. You see the spare mag down inside. Um, you, and also the cleaning rod. I mentioned before, it comes with a nickel cleaning rod. Uh, you can see that. And then the spare magazine fits down inside. And then the pistol fits in. It's a very compact unit. Now, I already did a video on baby Nambus. Uh, but here's what makes this special. And this is why I sought uh, to borrow it from Scott at Pre-98. This one also comes with this tag. Um, so this was uh, like a captured document, uh, but the GI that brought it home uh, ha kept the tag that it came with. Now, let me just say something about that. In the Pacific Theater, there are very few capture papers. I, I almost never see any capture papers or any documents. Um, in the European theater, you see a lot more of that. The, the, you know, the GIs wanted to bring stuff home. They would go to their commanding officer. By the way, a lot of people just threw it in their duffel bag and didn't worry about the regulations. But in the European theater, they seem to have enforced that a lot more than in the Pacific theater. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I'm sure Army regulations were universal, but for some reason, the Pacific theater was more like the Wild Wild West, meaning it was a, a lot more brutal, um, a, a lot of it was U.S. Marines, uh, so they're different units than the European theater. And just my opinion is that they, they were pretty lax about people bringing home stuff. Uh, so this came home from the war, and it is one of the very few guns that I've ever seen that has any documentation. Just to add to the value of this, on top of having the um, original tag, uh, let me read what it says. Uh, first of all, uh, the first line, it, that stands for U.S. Armed Forces Far East. Now, the Far East, and this says uh, North Luzon. So we know that uh, Luzon is the main island where Manila is, and North Luzon, there's, uh, we actually had a, a military base in the Philippines. I'll say a little bit more about that. But in Luzon, we had a very valuable uh, military base that the Japanese captured in 1942. 
and then we got it back in late 44. So North Luzon is where this was taken from. PW number 48, I'm not sure, that could be prisoner of war. Uh, I'll take a little bit of conjecture here. Um, that could be prisoner of war, but I'm not sure. If you know better, please, please let us know. We're always learning. And then the name of the pilot. The reason we know it's a pilot, I'll skip down to, it says, 4th Aerial Division of Japan. And the 4th Aerial Division of Japan was known to have been in the Philippines. Uh, the, 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 we have records that they were stationed, they actually were a land-based unit as opposed to uh, a naval or aircraft carrier unit. So this was a land-based aerial unit in Luzon. Uh, the name of the pilot, uh, if you're Japanese, please forgive me and give me tips on how to say his name. But here goes, Naburuchi Otuka. Um, I did uh, Google that name and could not find out anything about this particular pilot. So I'm going to do a little bit of forensic logic and walk through a little bit about who this pilot might have been. First, I know he wasn't a kamikaze because this was captured intact. Um, he, he carried it with him on the plane. By the way, I'm going to do a separate video on what kind of uh, guns a pilot would carry. And this certainly would qualify because, in my opinion, it would be a, a smaller uh, gun that would either fit in, in the front in the front, or go across the chest. Because if you had a, a larger pistol on your side, when you went to get, I can actually do it here, if I'm trying to eject and it gets caught, um, those cockpits were very small, so a smaller pistol would make sense. So, um, I, he, he wasn't a kamikaze, at least he wouldn't have had this with him if he was. Uh, secondly, uh, he probably came from a military family. The reason I say that is this was issued back in the mid-20s. He was a second lieutenant. If you look at the tag, it says uh, second, and that would be a second lieutenant. Uh, so he is a junior officer. He would not have been in the academy. These were given out to uh, academy cadets. Um, and not given, probably they had to purchase them. But academy cadets, again, only 6,000 made. Most likely a family member, maybe his father, was issued this pistol. And then he carried it to war. I, I mentioned in that video that it was considered an honor weapon. Just like the samurai swords, uh, generationally, you would pass these on. And it was a great honor to have the sword. Uh, this was considered an honor weapon that I would give to my son when he went off to war. So he probably came from a military family. The third conclusion is he most likely was captured. So he did not commit suicide. He handed this over, which is one of the reasons I think it might, PW might mean prisoner of war. If he went back to Japan in 1944, he definitely would have taken this back home with him. This would be one of his most prized possessions. But the only way he would have given it up if he was captured and handed it over to uh, a, a U.S. soldier or Marine and the tag was filled out and it was brought home from the war. Now let me uh, just go over a little bit about the climate of what was going on when uh, the soldier, uh, I wish I knew who brought this home, but when the soldier brought this home, what was going on in the war at that time? So I already mentioned 1942, actually right after Pearl Harbor. Again, I picked this up on December 7th, uh, um, Pearl Harbor Day. Within days of attacking Pearl Harbor, the Japanese attacked the Philippines. Uh, now, we were completely taken off guard, not, not only um, surprised by the audacity that the Japanese would attack uh, the Hawaiian Islands, which, by the way, was a protectorate territory, uh, not a state yet. Uh, the Philippines was uh, similar in that it was a protectorate of the United States. Uh, MacArthur actually uh, retired to the Philippines. He, he was uh, there uh, during his war service, and he retired to the Philippines because he loved it there. He loved the people there. Easy to understand. I've been to the Philippines. Phenomenal people um, and a phenomenal, uh, beautiful country. Uh, so he retired to the Philippines, but in July of 41, the United States kind of knew that we were going to go to war. Uh, because Japan was already taking the British, the, uh, Hong Kong, Malaysia. They began to go after British and Dutch colonies and take them. They felt that it was their divine right to control Asia. They had already invaded Korea and China um, and the, the uh, British and Dutch territories. And so now they were willing to take on the United States. Again, an audacious move, but they, they really felt that they could get away with it and the United States wouldn't, wouldn't fight back. So they invaded the Philippines within days 
of uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, and in 1942 completely took it over. Now we also know that MacArthur and just a few uh, of the officers uh, escaped. They were actually ordered to leave the Philippines, so, and they, their, their headquarters, the Far East headquarters, was in Manila, but they moved the headquarters to Australia. Thank you to our Aussie friends for hosting us during that period of time. So from 1942 to 1944, MacArthur was operating out of, um, out of Australia. What was happening in the Philippines, and by the way, if you remember the death march, the Bataan death march, uh, that happened after we surrendered. Most of the troops uh, did not get out. Uh, some of them fought in the mountains, they became guerrilla fighters. The Filipinos, uh, Filipino army, many of them were executed. Uh, many Americans were executed as well, but many, uh, many of the soldiers were executed. Some uh, were in the death march where many died. Uh, you've probably seen movies about that. It's a pretty sobering time in our history and very depressing in that we were caught with our pants down in, in uh, Pearl Harbor, but now we also have the added defeat of losing the Philippines. The United States had no way to resupply and reinforce the Philippine Islands, so we had to uh, uh, let it go. It was at that time that MacArthur made the famous phrase, I'll be back. No, actually, that was Arnold. You knew that. But he said, I shall return. And then in 1944, there's an iconic uh, a picture of, uh, it was actually staged, but he set up the cameras and everything, and they, they took a movie of it. He had quite a big ego, by the way. He loved to see himself in the press. Um, but he, he staged his return uh, to the Philippines, and then uh, after a long and uh, grueling uh, battle, we were able to take the Philippines back in, I, I think it was about October of 1944, we had retaken it. Now, many of the Japanese did not surrender, just like the Filipino army and some of the American guerrilla warfare in the, in, up in the mountains. Uh, some of the Japanese soldiers refused to, um, refused to surrender and instead uh, conducted uh, guerrilla warfare from within the Philippines all the way to the end of the war and even beyond. As a matter of fact, there was a Japanese soldier who didn't surrender. I think it was not until the 1960s. So he continued, well, he wasn't really fighting, but he was hiding out because he refused to surrender. Uh, but going back to our pilot, I believe he was one of the ones, he was probably one of the smarter ones who said, uh, we, we've lost the war, time to uh, uh, give up. And unfortunately, he had to give up his family treasure. I'm really proud to be able to bring this to you, show it to you, and thank you, Scott, for letting me borrow this. Thanks for watching, and make sure you like and subscribe, and forward this to some of your friends so they can enjoy the same pleasures that you get. And if you haven't already done so, don't forget to tap the bell so you'll be notified when we do new videos. I've got a lot more coming to you.